past like eight years, you've heard of Don Machi, okay? How to try to not pick up girls in a dungeon or something along those lines. You hear the name of this light novel title and you think it's going to be generic like every other one. And I will tell you one thing. I am like all of you. I, I am literally you right now. Literally. I watched the first season when it came out in like 2015 and I thought it was I. I thought it was mid. It wasn't good enough for me to get reinvested in it when season two, three, four dropped. When the side stories with the freaking sword princess arc thing dropped. When all that side shiz happened, I did not feel like getting reinvested into the world and picked that up. And that is until now. Season four did something unprecedented in the world of fantasy, especially etchy type fantasy, especially harem etchy type fantasy. It actually became great? I don't mean it like it retained its glory from the first season and didn't get worse, which is like probably what you're expecting because most of these fantasy haremish stuff, they just get worse and worse. Like the initial premises out there, you know, it's Shield Hero episode one blows your mind. You got this cool plot set up and then it just gets worse and worse with every single episode and every season until eventually you're just kind of watching it because you've been watching it until now. So you're not like going to stop watching it. That's what I thought Danmachi would be. I thought it would peter out. It gave its initial premise. You have this cool dungeon thing. You have these monsters monsters, epic fight scene, and then I thought it would just kind of degrade into, you know, your typical story structure with your harem elements where your main character becomes overpowered. I couldn't have been more wrong. I am so surprised that you have a story like Don Machi. How to pick up girls in a dungeon, all right? Is it wrong to try to pick up girls in a dungeon? A story about this dude with his little family of nitwits that band together and try to take down the, the dungeon monsters, which is like, it's a pretty generic seeming plot, but all of a sudden it gets a lot better. It gets darker. New characters are introduced with actual fleshed out backstory. You have a woman, you know, who likes the main character, who's not just a body, just a freaking Hara member body to be there and simp for the main dude. Someone with actual hopes and aspirations and a tragic backstory in their own right with an actual full arc. Today, we are delving into Don Machi and its story structure, how it went from mid to masterpiece and why I will definitely be picking it back up. I actually made a video talking about the lore of the different goddesses in Don Machi. I do have to say, Don Machi piqued my interest. So I saw this dude, Don Yul, made a video about the insane evolution of Don Machi. And I like to watch videos from up and coming channels. I like shouting them out. So Daniel here with this video on the insane evolution on Don Machi. And I'm excited to see it because I watched the first season of Don Machi a long time ago and I thought it was I. I heard it got better and it piqued my interest with the whole goddess lore thing because the lore of the goddesses is kind of great actually. So is the hentai. Is it wrong to pick up girls in a dungeon? Depending on the context, probably. However, in whoa, this context, hey, whoa. it's perfectly fine as today we're going to be looking at Don Machi and how it has taken a drastic change from season one to where it is now at the end of the fourth season. Yeah. Don Machi was never really something that anyone ever mentioned as like peak fiction or West Watch by any means, yeah. but it came onto the scene and has been a name that most people have at least heard of in the anime community. The absurd title is so. a good reason for that, not to mention the greatest mystery of the show. How the hell does that string hold those things up? But Goddess. Also important to its initial success was likely the world that it builds for itself. Viewers are made comfortable as the world is built around different types of mythos from the real world, yeah, so a there's a little bit of a media world, understanding. Another layer of intrigue, of course, is also the dungeon itself. Not even the people in the world of Don Machi truly understand just how deep the dungeon is and what mysteries it really holds. Yeah, there's I a like sense that. of wonder in learning more about this dungeon for the viewer as we get to see the characters we follow interact with new things on a pretty consistent basis. The same sense of wonder can be found throughout all sorts of fantasy and it's the reason the genre works as well as it does. Even with the worst isekai, there's still a draw to learn about an entirely different world than our own, even if that desire leads to nothing of substance. At first I thought Machi would once again be another anime that failed to make use of an interesting world, but in reality it just took a little bit of time to find its footing. Alright, alright. I'm glad he broke it down into seasons because I my experience in season one was this is the most mid basic fantasy world ever. The first season of Don Machi can be described as such an anime of all time. Of course, like I just mentioned previously, we are introduced <laughs> to this brand new world, so there's something to be gained, but that sense of wonder can only take someone so far. At the start, Bell is a pretty typical protagonist. Young and naive, he thinks he can take on the world, and he immediately gets his comeuppance when he's embarrassed, as he needs saving almost immediately. It wasn't really his fault as a high-level monster got away from the area it was meant to be in, but it still gets to him regardless. He shares the same yeah, traits yeah. that many other anime main characters have. He's a bit bitch made, but he can find the confidence in the right situations, and he has, of course, the dream to become a hero. See, here's the thing that I thought about Bell. My 
in my first thoughts introduced to Bell was he, he at least he's not like the bitch guy the bitch protagonist you know the whiny pussy guy that has no choice but to, to become a mad lad like he genuinely wants to become a mad lad he does have drive to him and I like that so much more than someone you know the, the the bitch character that gets thrust into a situation where they need to become a mad lad he's someone that he takes the initiative himself and he's also just not strong and he's alone in his guild so he doesn't have a lot of hope so he has to really pick himself up time and time again I respect that grind set a lot Pretty standard stuff. What sets him apart, at least at the beginning, is that he isn't stupidly overpowered. He does have an ability that allows his level to raise quickly as long as his emotions hold strong and he's inspired, but having the equivalent of an EXP modifier doesn't really make you any stronger in the moment. He still has to work his way up to grow his familia, because at the start, it's just him and Hestia, both with each other as they were desperate for a god-human pairing. And that's what the first season, which is a cute dynamic. So I did like sets it. out to do to set a foundation for our character to work with. Unlike later seasons, it's a short burst of multiple arcs as Bell grows his connections, Lily joins as a supporter, Welf is his blacksmith, and yeah. other characters like Seer and Ryu come close acquaintances with him. Of course, the end has a climactic battle, but it serves more as entertainment value than anything, as it takes a giant group of adventurers to take down the unexpected floor boss, even if Bell is the one to deal the final blow. <laughs> All right, all right. Yeah, the uh, movie, it exists, I guess. <laughs> this man did not have anything nice to say yet. It's also not in canon, so no need to talk about it. Let's go. Took around four years after the first season for the second to come around, and at this point, the light novel was actually pretty popular in Japan, likely leading to the flurry of sequels we've seen since. Second season generally does the same as the first. The first arc sparks a conflict that seems to have the single purpose of getting the Hestia Familia into usable living quarters, all while right, also expanding right. the size of the Familia, adding Mikoto onto the team. Afterwards, it gets into what is the main conflict as Bell adds yet another girl to his hair. I mean Familia, and establishes yes! connections with a rather powerful character in Aisha. The last tiny arc served to do a little bit of world building, while also expanding upon the relationship between Bell and Hestia. I oh, sort of question how well this part was adapted, but I have literally zero knowledge of the source material, so I can't really speak to that. But <laughs> okay. after a couple of seasons, we can finally get to what I believe to be the turning point Damn, in the quality of, the of Don of Machi. All, all right, so I did not see any of season, season three, three. gives us the first conflict that actually means something, and also the first okay. conflict that lasts the entirety of the season. Oh. Link doesn't always mean everything, but when you're able to expand upon a single point of interest, it makes for a much That's a handkerchief. more fleshed out piece of work that feels like it has stakes behind it. Bell finding and picking up Wiene sparks an event that will finally set into motion what I had been looking for from the show for a while. Okay. A lot of characters had their own little mini arcs as most anime do, but Bell has always just sort of been doing the same thing. Wait, the big arc is he finds a naked half-human in the woods? That's the big plot? They do this in every fantasy anime! First, gain some confidence struggles but in the end he saves the day right. finally however we have what we will call a true test of his resolve it's funny that season three went the way it did because i had been talking with friends that i watched the previous two seasons with and before season three we came to the conclusion that it would be good for the show and just generally interesting to see a larger scale conflict involving a multitude of familias where okay. our main group would have to make a decision on where they stand which couldn't lead to some growth for bell and uh well well, wouldn't you know, that's exactly what happened. I don't know what role the Xenos will play later down the road, but I know that in this season, at least, they played their role to perfection. I think something that never really gets explored in these anime where the main character is beloved by all around him is a situation that calls for people to question them. Bell, being who he is, wants to protect Wiene. In his eyes, she's nothing more than just the scared little girl, but of course, the rest of his friends aren't going to see it that way. They were very much like so that. ready to kill her when he revealed that he had it her with him, and even and after calming the situation, the strife doesn't end there. Lily would typically be on Belle's side for quite literally anything, but we see a bit of nuance from her as she's rather against taking in Wiene. Others have their concerns as well, but in the end, the typical anime thing is they all decide to put their faith in Belle and play along with his ideals. At this point, the gang has pretty much decided to be the lone force entirely on the side of the Xenos. Of course, maybe other familias would have also shown sympathy if we had the opportunity to see I more like perspectives, that. but it's pretty unlikely. Through most of the season, Bell grows closer to the Xenos, and mm. when it comes time to make the ultimate choice, he doesn't falter. Stood face to face with the Loki familia and with the person he admires most in eyes, Bell makes the choice to shield and enrage Wiene from them. Of course, he doesn't outright say that he's on the side of the monster, but to the viewer, his intention is clear and obvious. 
obvious. This leads Bell to even have a direct confrontation with Ayaz as he tries to get Winnie to safety as the Xenos attempt to head back down to the dungeon. This moment becomes interesting not only for Bell's growth, but we also get to see a side of Ayaz that most everyone probably didn't think existed. Hmm. As Winnie tore her wings off and nails in front of Ayaz, Ayaz decided shortly yeah. after that she was in the wrong after being horrified by the sight. Someone who's usually so devoid of emotion oh. showing a face of raw terror gave a much character more interesting boost to her character. Getting to see the true side to Hermes was also pretty interesting. We always knew he wasn't quite as he made himself out to be, but seeing him interested in Belle out of a sense of entertainment and wanting to find a real hero gives a bit more depth to that. Season ends with Bell restoring his honor among adventurers as he risks his life to fight Asterius, the Minotaur Xenos. It makes perfect sense for Bell to lose at that fight at the end because it's only the start of his growth. We have to take a dive into the fourth season to see where this newfound resolve towards his ideals is going to actually- I like that he loses. I, I know that that sounds kind of cringe, but I like that he loses. Most isekai style fantasy protagonists, they just win every time. And the ones that lose, they use that one loss to win every other battle. He's not over powered by any means. He tries to do the right thing. He he's a protagonist that I think a lot of isekai could learn from. Take him. <laughs> A concept I've talked about a few times on the channel is the writing idea of just taking your characters and putting them into a situation to see how they would react. Don Machi has ample opportunity to do this with the dungeon as its setting, and that's what the season strives to do. Everything Bell has been through up to this point gets called on as he goes on the expedition to a part of the dungeon he has never been. Of course he has this familiar with him, but also people from the connections he has made throughout these past three seasons. We're shown as the gang traverses downward that Bell is shown to be very competent and calm, which can't usually be said for him in seasons past. Lower floors are something that hold plenty of unknown for our group, so it's something that brings a lot of viewer interest when we not only get to see Bell be challenged by the unknown, but by the unknown to an extreme degree. I think the anime does right. a good job of setting up a total sense of despair during part one. It takes a new move and a lot of effort to take down the evolved monster that the group runs into during the expedition, but that was just to give a sense of scale for how difficult things were going to be in the coming episodes. An already terrifying okay. unknown turns into pure horror as we are introduced Ooh. to the real challenge Bell's new self is going to need to tackle. The carnage caused by the juggernaut was already enough to have me question oh how the God. cast was going to make it out of the situation alive, but when coupled by Bell and That's Ryu bad. being thrown down to the 37th floor with the juggernaut alone, and the floor boss being triggered against the supporting cast, there's nothing but an impending sense of doom. Most people likely wondered if every character was really going to make it out of this alive. Part 2 of the season is where we get things really started and have some great focus on the supporting cast, as Bell at this point is just awesome. being tested with no real need yeah, to I develop I heard really it. great things about season 4. I love an anime that gets better and better, instead of an anime that banks on its plot and then just just gets worse and worse any further at the moment in time. The floor boss fight did a great job at establishing that the party is plenty strong, even if they don't have Bell with them. Really, before now, we hadn't seen the other characters do much in the way of fighting, so to see them all up against a, such a challenge and to come out of it alive is something that probably needed to happen to start moving the series in a proper direction. Rather than just a harem-like show where everyone needs to be babied by Bell's ever-growing power, they are able to handle themselves, all which right. is just overall refreshing to see in an anime. Of course, the real meat of part two was how Ryu and Bell handled the cards they were dealt. Every now and then we would get a little bit of the hint to the past that Ryu left behind, but now she is the star of the show. Most episodes involve a flashback with her interacting with other members of the Estrella family, showing where she gained okay. her personal values from. She's the perfect person to pair with Bell as her own way of doing Building things will push Bell to do things he needs to do in order anime? to make it out alive. Nani? Looting the corpses of the lost adventures is something that Bell of old probably never would have been able to do. Even now he hesitates a little bit, but now that he has the strength and experience to rise it's for the best, he goes the ahead oh, with the it. Wind. Ryu herself is an interesting case. She has been broken emotionally by the events at hand after having already had a run-in with the Juggernaut before. Stred overcomes her common sense and there's not really been a uh, point where she armor. seems to intend to make it back alive, intend to die in the same grave as her comrades. All of their struggles oh, build up to their arrival at the oh, Colosseum. Dead. Ryu finally finds the point in time where she feels she can sacrifice herself under the guidance of it being all for Bell, when in reality she's just looking for an excuse to be done with everything. Bell shatters her expectations and ours when he breaks back into the arena and causes oh. the entire thing to collapse, leading them to that hidden oasis hidden underneath the floor. I should just skip season two and three, watch season four. I know that's not the correct thing to do, but it's the thing I might be doing. In character talk, I want to shout out the opening sequence to the 
following episode. Seeing Ryu's familia massacred and what they ended up doing to save her was Damn. incredibly heartbreaking, but when the music started playing I and the true fighting against the juggernaut writing. from her friends began- I love a good tragedy. I love when Guts from Berserk walks up to a little demon child and the child is crying and saying, please don't kill me. Guts looks at him and says, do I look like Tanjiro to you? And then murders him. That's what I love to see. Again, I could tell the scene was going to be an absolute spectacle. Between Damn. the animation, direction, and voice acting, everything about it seemed perfect. The final battle against the Juggernaut was easier than I expected it to be, but I attribute this to the fact that it dropped 10 floors and had to fight everything it came across in the dungeon, so it was probably a bit tired and injured, leaving it a bit more vulnerable in the end. What I did like though was Ryu's monologue during her attack, pretending that her summoned spirits were her friends. She mentions that even deep down she knows it's highly unlikely that anything like that would happen, but yeah. it's something she chose to believe in in that moment. She chose to live on for them, and instead of the hero Bell getting that final Final blow, Ryu is the one to get the last laugh as she avenges her friends. Dude, I love a good tragic character getting closure. The evolution of Don Machi is pretty incredible. It's not often that you see something that not just has a rough start, but a rough couple of seasons rise to be something of this level of quality. Went from wondering how it continued to get more seasons to hoping that it keeps going on that same train. Sure that the content from here is only going to get even more wild, and I'm ready to see what steps Bell takes next on his journey. Thanks for sticking with me through this video, and I hope to see you in another one. But before you go, so I can say that I am very close to a thousand subscribers, and I'd like to hit that mark. So Hell if you yeah, the gamers, check out Daniel's channel. Give him a subscribe. Support this the small channels on YouTube. They need all the help they can get. Just do it. YouTube's evil. And uh, let me know if you want me to make more Don Machi content. You tell me if you want more Don Machi. If you want me to actually watch this and maybe and analyze it or something, you, you let me know. Like, subscribe, and follow me on Twitch. Stay weird, fam.